a physical exam. A veterinarian should look at your horse at least annually, if not biannually, to make sure everything's kosher. I see some people laughing. <laughs> Maybe it's much more frequently than that when our horses decide they want to misbehave. And I bet a lot of you, unfortunately, see us much more than twice a year. I'm sorry. Um, we can only control them so much, right? Um, so physical exam, we can use that to catch things ahead of time, right? Prevent bigger problems. Vaccination. Prevention. Our vaccines are super reliable. Why not do them? They're pretty simple. We can prevent big problems that way. Coggins. I'm not going to harp on this very much because you're going to get a whole talk about Coggins, but we'll touch on it briefly. Parasite control. We all know a lot about deworming and how important it is. We're lucky that our population of horses doesn't have a ton of problems with this, but it's really important. And the reason we don't have a ton of problems is probably because we all do a great job at taking good care of our horses. Dentistry, that's a big one, and I think it's often missed or forgotten about. And then the other stuff, because there's this whole other realm of things that, what category do we put it under? Our horses obviously need a lot of stuff, and I get questions that fall under the other stuff category all the time, and we could spend days talking about each of those categories, but we're going to try to narrow it down a little bit. And I'm happy to take questions throughout the whole presentation, so if we're talking about a topic and somebody has a question, just throw your hand up and I'm happy to answer them. All right, biannual exams. Our horses can't tell us if something's wrong, most of the time. Sometimes they're very dramatic and they think that they're dying, but <laughs> most of the time, they can't tell us what's going on, right? So why not take a closer look? I know that a lot of times when we're looking at your horse, it, it doesn't seem like we've done a ton. Well, that's because we do it all the time. And so we're looking at their eyes, their feet, their legs, their skin, we're looking them all over to make sure we don't see smaller problems that we can address now to prevent bigger problems in the future. The physical exam. So everybody knows the more basic part of a physical exam, right? The TPR. So our temperature, pulse, respirations. These vitals help us learn a lot about your horse. Are we stressed? Are we uncomfortable? Are we having trouble breathing? We have plenty of horses that even though they're not breathing heavily, they're breathing faster than they should. And maybe we need to look in to why they're doing that. Um, our normal ranges for these are very important to know because a lot of times we'll call and ask, you guys will call and ask questions for, you know, about is this an emergency? And we'll ask, okay, what's their temperature? Have a thermometer, please. Digital thermometers are super cheap. Everybody that has a horse should have one. It's a really easy way to figure out, okay, is our problem the fact that we're truly colicking, or do we have a fever and so we don't really want to eat because of that? Because we're going to handle those situations differently based on what the horses tell us in their physical. So a normal temperature, 99 to 101.5. Anything 101.5 or over is concerning or something that's worth looking into, right? That is considered a fever. Respirations should be anywhere between 28 and 44. Horses are delicate and reactive animals, as we all know. So it can range quite a bit, but that's where we would like that, or I'm sorry, pulse. But that's where we would like it to be. Um, I have plenty of horses, they come in here, their heart rate's gonna be 48. It's very exciting coming to the clinic, right? Some of our horses are leaping off the walls. I wouldn't expect them to have a heart rate below 44 if they're acting like that. But that's a good range for them to be in at home. And that's something that your veterinarian always looks at when coming to see if there's something going on and we're trying to figure out what's going on with them. And then respiration, so 10 to 24. Their respiration should actually be fairly slow. If a horse is breathing much heavier than that, we have a problem. <laughs> All right, capillary refill time and mucous membranes. Who here has ever looked at their horse's gums? All right, that's pretty good, guys. So some of our horses are a little bit more amenable to this process than others. Um, some do not appreciate this activity, but most of them, if you look at the corner of their mouth and you lift up their lip just a little bit, they'll let you take a peek. And it's good to be familiar with what your horse's gums look like. But when your veterinarian comes and does an exam, that's something we're gonna look at, at because it can tell us a lot about their hydration status and how they're doing overall. So our mucous membranes should be pink and moist. If they're tacky or pale, there's something going on and we're probably dehydrated. That capillary refill time is taken by pushing your thumb on their gums and it's gonna blanch it and that should refill back to their normal color within one to two seconds. If you have enough time to really think about it and it's still white, they're probably dehydrated and it's prolonged, and so give us a call. Digital pulses, this is a tough one, and don't feel bad because they are hard to feel. So uh, I remember when I was a young student, um, 
I was embarrassed because I was like, I don't know what they're talking about. I can't feel anything, but I'm going to pretend. <laughs> it's hard to feel. The biggest thing as horse owners is, can you feel it easily? So while you're picking your horse's feet out on a regular basis, put your hand around their ankle. Can you feel it regularly? No. Great. Okay. So if your horse comes in one day and seems a little owie, can you feel it really easily now? If so, something's probably up. And that's a really good indicator for us. Are we maybe trying to founder? Or we could have a foot abscess or something like that. So it's a really good thing to get familiar with, you know, what is normal for your horse. If your horse has just been running around, ignore it. They will be elevated. Wait until they've been standing around calm, and that's a good, way to, a good time to assess them. And then body condition score, or BCS. I'm sure you guys hear us talk about this all the time. Um, so the scale is from one to nine. Five is considered ideal. We would love for all of our horses to be at ideal. Just like humans, we would all love to be a five, right? Well, many are from six to nine and overweight, and many are from one to four underweight. And this can vary a little bit. There are many older horses that have terrible arthritis that we kind of have to be careful, and maybe their ideal is going to be on the leaner side and closer to a four. But we'd like to stay in that moderate area so that we know that they're in a safe place as far as their weight goes. Judging body condition score, though, is super subjective. So I have lots of horses that have this huge belly and are ribby, and then they have this huge shoulder pad, this huge crest, and so how do you evaluate that, right? So the purpose of this scale is to try to average those areas, but it's not a perfect system, and so their overall appearance is really important. But judging their body condition score when we do our physical is really helpful for us to know, okay, do we need to change some of our nutrition? Do we need to run a metabolic panel and make sure we don't have Cushing's or insulin resistance? All of those things, and if we have if we pay attention to those things early on, then we're much more likely to catch something big or something before it becomes big. Makes our lives a lot easier, right? Okay, so when we're looking at your horse again, we're looking at the whole horse. We're checking out their eyes. We're doing the vitals, but that's really the most basic. We are looking them all over to make sure we're catching a problem before it starts. And we always look at their feet. Okay, so prevention. Prevention is really easy, right guys? And so I know everybody worries about over-vaccinating, but the way that I think about it is a vaccine is pretty cheap and easy. Treating the diseases that we vaccinate for, is not easy to treat, and we fail most of the time. And that's the reason that we have these vaccines. So some of the requirements for, having, for making a vaccine are to make sure it works well enough and to make a vaccine for a disease that isn't treated very well. It's a big deal. And that's why these vaccines are made. And so we pick those things. Okay, we need, we need to prevent this because we're probably going to lose the horse if they get it. And this vaccine works pretty darn well. And we can almost guarantee that they're not going to get the disease. So we have two categories of vaccines, core and risk-based vaccines. The risk-based vaccines vary a lot depending on your activities and the area that you live in. For us, most of our risk-based vaccines are based on um, the area that we live in. For our area, and for most areas, the core vaccines include rabies, eastern and western encephalitis, West Nile, and tetanus. Rabies and tetanus are needed across the board no matter where you are. In fact, they are annual, well, rabies is, at, is always an annual vaccine. Tetanus, we also often booster every six months. And the reason is, is if they ha get a laceration and they haven't had a tetanus vaccination in the last six months, they need one. Horses are super prone to tetanus and it lives in their environment. No matter how clean we make the environment, no matter what we do, we can't bubble wrap them, right? They're going to they're gonna do something at some point. So have that vaccine on board. Rabies vaccine, of course, have that on board. That is a huge public health concern and we'd like to avoid the problem. Just protect them. Eastern and Western encephalitis and West Nile. Those are part of our core vaccines because we see tons of mosquitoes, right? And we used to only do it once a year. We have started doing it twice a year because we're seeing it more. It's February and I had flies in the truck last week. So the bugs are not going away even when the season, I mean, I'm complaining about the cold all the time, right? But it's still warm enough for the bugs to pop up the moment that the temperature rises and the mosquitoes can just pop up like that too. And so these mosquito-borne diseases are, we're seeing them a lot more. So why not prevent, right? Um, the it's not wrong to do it once a year, but 
twice a year, we are much more likely to prevent the disease. And the likelihood of these things happening, not huge, but if it's your horse, you're gonna remember that forever. And then it's a huge bummer. All right, our risk-based vaccines. I'm gonna actually start with flu rhino because for most of our population of horses that we see, they really need a flu rhino. And that's covering for influenza and herpes virus. And the reason I say that is most people think that they only need a flu rhino if they're taking their horses places. But I have had herpes outbreaks in farms that the horses had not gone anywhere. It can happen. When we think about our other equine activities or equestrian activities, we go to other people's farms. Our neighbors have horses and they go other places. We share equipment. Your veterinarian's traveling from farm to farm. Your farrier is traveling from farm to farm. And despite all of our efforts to not spread things, it can still happen. And so covering our horses for these things are important. Potomac horse fever. I say coming to an area near you because this is kind of new. So we did not used to worry about Potomac horse fever in this area. I'm from Virginia, and so we worried about it all the time. We see it all the time. Um, it is newer into our area. So our first case was like a year and a half or two years ago in the Charlotte area. And since then, we have had more cases. So we have just started vaccinating for Potomac horse fever. This vaccine is not as mm, exciting or wonderful as our core vaccines. I like to liken it to the COVID vaccine. This vaccine is not guaranteeing that they will not pick up Potomac horse fever, but we lose less horses from Potomac horse fever if they are vaccinated for it. So this particular vaccine, not the most wonderful one in the world, but it's better than nothing, right? And when they get this disease and they can get it in their water source, so we really can't do much to prevent it ourselves as far as our management. Of course, we all clean our water troughs, but bugs are really good at going in as soon as we clean things, right? It seems like we never even cleaned it. Um, so they, horses get laminitis, fever, colitis. They get really sick really fast. So it's worth covering them for it. Strangles, this is a big question mark because this vaccine is actually, it's a bit more reactive than our other vaccines. And we have to be careful because if we vaccinate a horse that has recently had strangles and we didn't know it, it can actually make them sick. So for horses that we don't know their background very well, we run an antibody titer to make sure that they're safe to get the vaccine. But not all horses truly need this vaccine. So if you have a barn that um, you're bringing in a bunch of off the track thoroughbreds or horses from the kill bin, any rescue, the, your population of horses that have been hanging out there for years at your farm, they are at risk because of the new horses coming in. So that's a great population to consider vaccinating. Um, if you have a whole lot of young horses or if you're going to a lot of densely populated um, events, then it's something to consider. But truly not everybody needs a strangles vaccine. That is on a case-to-case -case basis. And then botulism. This is also a case-to-case -case basis. Round bales, that's the big thing. So we all know the bottom of our round bales. They get kind of gross, right? It, it's actually disgusting by the time they're done with it. So the organism that causes botulism, it's really good at growing and decaying matter. And so that's where it would like to live. So our horses and our population that are gonna be at risk are the ones eating round bales regularly. And so if we do have round bales, then botulism's a vaccine that we would wanna consider. And that's, once you get the series started, it's an annual vaccine. And so it's pretty easy to do with the rest of your vaccines. But it's important if you're regularly feeding those round bales. Okay, Coggins, again, I'm not gonna talk about this very much because you're gonna get a lot of this. I just want to give my brief public service announcement um, that all horses are at risk. We all grew up thinking, well, we're not really going anywhere. It doesn't matter. It does because biting flies carry this. And so if your neighbor has a horse that is infected, it can carry it over to yours. And then if your horse never gets tested, you never know that your horse is then sharing it with other horses from those flies that are traveling around the neighborhood. And we're having an outbreak right now, which is why we're focusing on that today. If we all do our due diligence and screen our horses, we're more likely to succeed and avoid, and avoid outbreaks like this. That's all I'll say about that. Since you're gonna hear a lot about it next. Okay, parasite control. Who here has run a fecal egg count on their horse in the last year? That's not too bad. Okay, so I grew, I grew up, um, I was taught to deworm my horse every eight weeks. Who was taught that? Haha. <laughs> And we thought we were doing the right thing. In fact, I think we thought we were overachieving. We were pretty proud of ourselves. Well, we accidentally caused 
resistance to our dewormers. Um, it's nobody's fault, we just didn't know, right? So horses are meant to have a small population of the good bugs or non-resistant parasites. And so if we wipe all of those out by deworming all, of the time, all the time, then the bad bugs or the resistant ones have the opportunity to over proliferate because they have no competition. So horses are meant to have a small population of good parasites in their bellies. It's called a refugia so that those kind of protect them from the really bad bugs that want to go crazy. So we have now learned the best way to handle our parasites is to run a fecal twice a year, preferably, preferably at least once a year though, so that we know what category they lie in. And so we categorize them as low shedders, high shed, or moderate shedders, and high shedders. If your horse is a low shedder or has say zero eggs per gram, it does not mean that they don't have any parasites. It just means they're where they should be. Because our fecal egg count, it's not perfect. It's what your horse shed in that one bowel movement and there are still bugs hiding out in their belly. But it gives us a good snapshot of what's going on in there. Those low shedders should then just be dewormed two times a year, spring and fall. And the biggest thing to remember is that you don't want to use the same dewormer all the time. And we don't want to just change between brands, but really you need to change between deworming classes. So I often, to simplify things, rotate between an ivermectin with praziquantil and a moxidectin with praziquantil because it's easy and I know that they work well. And so Equimax, for example, and Quest Plus, they do a great job. You have those to give each horse, one once a year, the other once a year. You're, pretty, you're mostly covered for the average horse. Then for your moderate and your high shedders, you're gonna deworm more based on your veterinarian's recommendation and how the horse is doing. Sometimes we choose to give horses like that a Panicure Power Pack, that's kind of our heavier hitter. That is, if we have concerns, it depends on what's going on with the horse. Sometimes we just deworm more frequently throughout the year and we check more frequent fecals to make sure that we're succeeding and that we don't have a more resistant population to be worried about. And then, and so that's kind of a, the spiel of our, our um, targeted deworming. Next is our pasture management. So who picks piles out of their field ever? Piles of manure. It's a really boring job, right? Cleaning stalls is enough work. But especially if we have a lot of horses in one paddock, because a lot of us, we need more room for our horses, right? And so we have a lot of horses in one place, the manure can build up pretty easily. And so we do want to be cognizant of our pasture management to help decrease the parasites. Because if they're eating next to their pile of manure, they're certainly going to pick up more parasites. And so our pasture management and our stall management helps us to decrease that population quite a bit in addition to our deworming protocols and running those fecal egg counts. Oh, and it also saves you money. Um, the running fecal egg counts is often cheaper than how we used to deworm, you know? Dewormer's not that cheap. And so when you were doing it every eight weeks, you really spent a lot of money on dewormer that you didn't have to. And in fact, we were spending more money to cause some problems. So keep that in mind too. Okay, dentistry. Whose horse has had their dental float this year? All right. So, <laughs> well, okay, no, in the, in the last year, not in 2023. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. In the last year. Um, so every horse should have a sedated oral exam once a year. Reason being, we find some really exciting things in there sometimes, and it's amazing what horses won't complain about. I had some very diligent owners who their horse had just started to be a little bit fussy with the bit, so they were like, well, we'll schedule our dental float. I think we're coming due, and I'm very glad they did. When I got in there, their horse had a stick across his mouth, and oh it, was, it like had left an indentation across his soft palate, and he was like, I'm fine. Everything's cool. They lie to us. Um, <laughs> sometimes they're huge weenies, right? And then sometimes we're like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> so um, having an annual exam is important. This picture is also an excellent example. This is a horse that Dr. Lepresti saw. And if somebody were to just peek in the front of the horse's mouth, they would never know that that was hiding there. Because even if, with their mouth wide open, right, and this is a sedated horse with a speculum in, it's, even, it's still hard to see that, right? It's dark in there. So this, I see some people looking. This is a very tall tooth in the back. That, and those tall teeth, they hit the top, and it hurts. And it makes it so that they can't chew side to side as well, too. So problems like that can go without anybody noticing because the horse won't let you know. And if we don't look, then we will never find out. 
most horses, when we check them every year, just need a routine dental float. That's pretty easy. They get their sharp enamel points because unfortunately their teeth are not perfectly aligned in their mouth and we file those down and that's the end of it. But we are always looking for dental pathology too. And I would say 20% of the dentals that I do, I find some form of dental pathology. And the good thing about that is like we were discussing prevention. A lot of times we prevent bigger problems by finding them early on. So the most common thing I probably see is a diastema or a space between teeth. And horses will get tiny, tiny spaces between their teeth that where feed will pack. And it gets a little stinky and it can cause abscesses or sinus infections. Well, a lot of times, if we're doing our routine dental, we find those before they actually cause an infection. We widen that diastema so there's room for the feed to fall back out and we're good to go. A lot of times we prevent those things really easily. Not always, but if you've ever dealt with a sinus infection or a tooth root abscess, it is a pain in the booty. So it's a good way to prevent those bigger problems. We can find things early so that they don't become a thing. Makes all of our lives a lot easier, right? Okay, the other stuff. I think most horse people have heard, no hoof, no horse. Who's heard that saying? It's a real thing. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> um, Okay, so our horses stand on these little toothpicks, right? With like pegs at the end. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Who made them that way? Well, those tiny, tiny feet are very important to them. And they're very sensitive. At least 80% of the lamenesses or problems that we see are foot related. Um, our maintenance makes a huge difference. Having them trimmed and shod frequently enough is a, makes a huge difference. One, because if their toe gets really long or their heel gets really stacked, that puts stress, stress on important structures and can cause pathology. Um, the other thing is, if your farrier is looking at your horse's feet more frequently, you are then giving them the ability to treat problems before they become bigger problems. Again, prevention. So thrush, white line disease, those are things that your farriers can identify very easily and help you treat before they're actually making your horse sore. They can also often save you a vet visit by addressing those, those, those problems a lot earlier. All right, nutrition. So we could talk for days about nutrition, right? I think that I get the most questions about nutrition when I'm on farm calls and we're doing our annual wellness exams. And that's because it's not an easy thing and it's not a one size fits all. So we have to feed each individual, right? Especially in our big boarding facilities, we have to simplify things in order to make our lives easier by trying to put everybody on a uniform diet. But then you've got this really fat horse over here saying, mm, I can't have that diet. And then the skinny one over here saying, I need 10 other things. Um, and and it's, it's complicated. And you read a lot of things on the internet, right? That are like, this is the best product you'll ever see. And it's not always true. Um, most of the products from the big brands, they actually do a great job. They have nutritionists that are making sure that you have safe, balanced diets for your horses. Um, but the, the simplest thing to remember when you're thinking about your horse's nutrition is to always maximize forage, right? They didn't eat grain out in the wild, did they? So maximize your forage. That's the first thing to always do. Reduce your concentrates if you can. So if I have a thin horse, I'm gonna ha give them as much forage as I can and then add in grains. If I have a fat horse, then I need grain. They can have a ration balancer. So that's like their vitamins and minerals without all the calories and sugar and then forage. And sometimes we unfortunately have to reduce their forage and soak it, depending on how fat they are. It, it's different for everyone, right? So never hesitate too, to ask your veterinarian questions about your horse's nutrition, because it's not easy, it's not simple. Okay, blood work. I've been very proud of many people asking me, why do equine vets not require annual blood work on horses like small animal vets do? And really, it's because as an industry, most people have been like, I don't want to do that. I was so proud when I was asked this because I was like, absolutely, we can run annual blood work. Why not? Like I was saying, our horses can't always tell us that something's up. And if we can catch something early on, we're much more likely to treat it successfully. So running annual blood work is never a bad idea. Even if it's every other year, if we need to tone it down a little bit because we know our horses are expensive, asking the question every once in a while is always a good thing. I had a horse this year that actually, we had done baseline blood work, which was great. And she had some values that were a little bit funny, but nothing interesting. But then when she was acting funny later, we were able to compare that and see, oh, 
that's her normal, this is not. And so it's really useful for us too, especially when horses are being very subtle. You know, they don't always just go off their feet or throw themselves on the ground. Sometimes they're just hmm, kind of not right. And so having some baseline blood work is really helpful for us to help assess your horses better. She's in utter, utter cleaning. Um, not our favorite activity, but something that does have to be done. I will say, to my benefit, there was a study that came out fairly recently that said we're cleaning things too much, just like people, right? If we use soap all the time, then we're, we're killing that good bacteria that's on our skin. Same thing with horses. But horses do need to be checked for beans regularly. And if you have those nasty crusts, just pull them off. Um, sheath and udder cleanings, they are important. Horses will start itching, their, rubbing their tails raw because they're itchy on their belly and they clearly can't itch that themselves. Um, and every once in a while, we'll see an infection related to that, not often at all, but um, the beans specifically, that can cause an obstruction. I have pulled some out this big and very irritated that I was like, wow, I'm very impressed things were still working. And so something to always check. And if you aren't sure where to find the bean, ask the veterinarian, we're happy to show you. And most horses are very good for their owners to do it. I do have some kickers that we take advantage when we do their teeth and we just go ahead and get their sheath done at the same time. But a lot of them will let you guys check it out, make sure everything's cool, and then you're good to go. Um, ophthalmic exam, I throw this out there because I think that eyes can easily be forgotten about. Um, and I recently had a farm that um, we look at their horses regularly. They were doing very well, never had any signs of uveitis. And I was very proud of the owners because they noticed when they seemed a little bit cloudy and not that, not that blue cloudy uveitis eye that everybody knows well, they just were a little bit off. And sure enough, they, they had acquired a disease that was causing multiple horses to get uveitis. And the sooner that you act on those problems, the more likely we are to save their vision. Unfortunately, horses' eyes are very sensitive. They can go blind fairly easily. Um, and so paying attention to those things is super important. But also, if your veterinarian is looking at your horse a couple times a year and peeking at their eyes, then we know what's normal for them. Or, hmm, we have some signs now that maybe we had a uveitis flare. And that can go unnoticed very easily. Sometimes it's just their eyes teared a little bit. Um, our classic uveitis flares are, you know, they're squinting and they're really upset and things are swollen, but that's not always the case. They can be very subtle until they're not, and then it's a big deal. So if we can catch it earlier, once again, we clearly have a theme, right? But if we can catch it earlier, then it makes things a lot easier to treat and we're a lot more successful. And then overall appearance. So again, we're looking at your whole horse, and that's a big part of your 365 wellness. So you guys are looking at them every day, which is why we want you guys to have an idea of what to look for, and then throw us in there a couple times a year, and we can help you guys find problems, or really prevent problems. All right, so don't hesitate to ask any of us questions about your horses, even if it seems like a silly question. I have people tell me all the time, they're like, this is totally off topic and it's probably dumb. It's not. It's not. If it's a question you've been having about your horse, ask it. It's free to ask these questions too. And Dr. Lepresti is going to touch on this for sure too, but if you're not sure there's a problem, call us. It's free to call us and ask, is this a problem or is everything okay? We can help you guys work through that. Um, so I think you guys, most of you guys know us, but I'm Dr. Peacock, one of the associate veterinarians. Dr. Lepresti is our other associate, and Dr. Castro is our surgeon and owner. Um, Dr. Lepresti and I, you'll see in the field. So we'll come to your farms and you can ask us all the questions, show us your hay, show us your grain, all that fun stuff. Um, and Dr. Castro, you'll see in house, but you'll see all of us for emergencies. And so we want to be familiar faces to you all too. So seriously, don't hesitate, call and ask questions. Any questions? Speaking of.